In this slideshow, I discuss the cyclical phenomenon of remission and relapse. I start by describing how the cycle typically manifests and the sort of thoughts and feelings that tend to occur in people who stammer as they go through that cycle. And I offer an explanation for the cycle from the perspective of the variable release threshold hypothesis. I then discuss the specific issue of remission and relapse following therapy and some useful insights the experience of remission and relapse can bring us, both into the nature of stammering as well as into the way therapies often impact upon stammering. The final part of the slideshow is devoted to discussing what we can do to minimise the extent of relapse and how we can use periods of relapse to our advantage. Anyone who stammered for a significant part of their life will have experienced that the severity of stammering fluctuates over time. Sometimes these fluctuations can be such that during periods of remission it seems as though the stammer has completely disappeared but then a few days, weeks or even years later it returns just as severely as ever. If you've ever been through an experience like this you will quite likely be aware of how devastating the experience of relapse can be, especially if the period of remission enabled you to experience a substantially improved quality of life. A period of remission may make it possible for a person who stammers to connect with other people, to make friends and to move forward in his life and career. Equally, a major relapse may lead to loss of friends, loss of career opportunities and a loss of ability to fulfil one's potential. Whatever the case, the experience of relapse can be extremely challenging and difficult to cope with. During such periods, people who stammer may find themselves struggling with a significant increase in feelings of depression, loneliness, inadequacy and failure. Because of this, it's vital for people who stammer to understand the nature of this cyclical phenomenon and to be prepared for it. If you've lived through more than one experience of remission and relapse, you may well have started to recognise that there's a pattern to the process. Periods of remission tend to start when you're least expecting them. Ironically, often at times when your ability to speak fluently appears to have hit rock bottom and all your efforts to improve your fluency through therapy have failed. At such times there's a natural tendency to give up trying. Although giving up may appear to be a step in a negative direction, the acceptance and adoption of, of lower, less perfectionistic standards with respect to your speech is exactly what's needed. Because as you allow your speaking standards to fall, the vigilance with which you monitor your speech for errors and imperfections will decrease. And this decreased awareness of speech errors and imperfections causes the release threshold to fall. And as a consequence, the tendency to block reduces and words start to come out more easily. All of a sudden, you find that the stammer has gone into remission. What then follows is a honeymoon period during which you're intensely relieved to be free of the burden of stammering and finally able to do and to enjoy doing many of the things that, you were, previous, that were previously not possible due to the stammer. As you settle into this state of remission, almost inevitably you'll find that you start to become attached to it and to develop a whole new set of hopes and expectations, all based upon the presumption that your newfound fluency will continue. The remission itself may last a few days, a few months or even a few years, but whatever the case, sooner or later something's bound to happen that will dent your confidence in it. Perhaps a difficult or emotional conversation that causes some minor disfluencies or an unwanted change in your voice, or perhaps some difficulty articulating some words due to being tired, having caught a cold or having a hangover. All sorts of things can happen that can prompt in you the thought that perhaps the stammer might be coming back. And now, all of a sudden, that thought may be very worrying, especially if you built up a whole new way of life based around your ability to speak fluently. If the stammer comes back, 
your new way of life might fall apart. Faced with this worry, unless you clearly understand how the cycle of remission and relapse works, almost inevitably you'll find yourself on the lookout for signs that the stammer might be coming back, and you'll most likely start to monitor your speech more vigilantly, listening to each word, checking for signs of disfluency or of blocking. And of course, if you do this, the closer you look, the more such signs you're likely to find. And, and each time you find another such sign, the fear that the stammer is returning is reinforced. If you respond in this way, and if you then make the mistake of trying to articulate more carefully and trying to control how your voice sounds and trying to avoid or suppress your speech errors, you'll drive the release threshold back up to a higher level which will immediately make it more difficult to get the words out. And then, before you know it, you've started blocking again and the relapse has begun. The ideal response to this rise in the release threshold when it happens would be simply to accept it, to accept the fact that some blocks have returned and to be pragmatic about dealing with them, jumping over them where possible, using a fluency shaping technique where necessary. However, unless you understand what's happening and are prepared for it, you're likely to be overwhelmed by the fear that the stammer is returning and that all the progress that you've made, thanks to the remission, is all about to fall apart. And if that's the case, these pragmatic options may simply not come to mind and instead you're likely to find yourself panicking and resorting to unhelpful avoidance and use of excessive force to push words out. And once you've responded in that way a few times, the ability to respond in a calm, rational way may have effectively been pushed out of reach. And then gradually over a period of days or weeks, the stammer is likely to return with full force and your new life may indeed start to fall apart. You may try as hard as you can to recommence whatever speech therapy techniques you've learned, but while still gripped by this fear of loss, these techniques may effectively be impossible to employ. Moreover, the faith that you once had in those techniques is likely to have evaporated and they may no longer seem to work. Eventually, one speech hits rock bottom again and the cycle of remission and relapse is complete. The cycle of remission and relapse can proceed relatively independently of external events. However, more often than not, periods of remission and relapse appear to be linked to the things that happen to us in our lives. And in particular, periods of remission often begin during therapy, which frequently leads both clients and therapists to presume somewhat prematurely that the therapy has been successful. However, equally often, after a temporary period of remission following therapy, clients then go through a period of relapse during which some or all of their symptoms may return to how they were before they started therapy. The high rate of relapse following therapy calls into question the presumption that it's always a therapy that causes the initial remission. An alternative theory for remission, and then relapse following therapy, is that people who stammer generally begin therapy when their stammering is at its most severe. If this is the case, it's possible that many clients begin therapy just at the point of time when their stammering was destined to start to improve and would have improved anyway, even if they hadn't gone for therapy. This phenomenon is sometimes referred to as regression to the mean. Another theory is that the therapy may have played a role in the remission although the role it plays may have little to do with the validity of the technique the therapist employs. It may be that much of the benefit people derive from therapy boils down to a placebo effect. This is especially likely to be the case if the client is impressed by the therapist and by what she does. This theory is backed up by the general finding that all forms of therapy for stammering generally seem to produce roughly similar results. However, some therapists consistently get better results than others. This finding is known as the dodo effect.
Exactly how the placebo effect works is not clear, but one possibility is, is that if the therapist manages to instill faith in her client that the stammer is going to reduce, the client no longer feels the need to keep monitoring his speech so vigilantly for errors and disfluencies, and no longer feels the need to try to avoid or eliminate errors and disfluencies. On the contrary, he's much more likely to simply accept his speech as it is, comforted by his faith that things are getting better. With this accepting mindset, the level of the stammerer's release threshold is likely to reduce, and consequently his tendency to block will reduce, and his words will come out more fluently. This increase in fluency then further reinforces his faith in the therapy, which then leads to a further reduction in the level of the release threshold. One of the telltale signs that it's the placebo effect behind the improvement in the client's speech, rather than a direct consequence of the specific form of therapy that they're receiving, is that the improvement occurs rather too quickly, often before they've even learnt how to employ any of the techniques that the therapist teaches. This is a real problem for the therapist and ultimately also for the client because once a client's stammer has gone into remission, he's no longer so motivated to learn the therapeutic techniques or to practice them in real life situations. Consequently, when something comes along, as something inevitably does, to dent his faith and make him start blocking again, he finds that he's not sufficiently skilled in the techniques to be able to successfully employ them. At such times, the tendency then is to panic, lose faith and give up on the therapy. In contrast, if the client has really employed the therapy in the way it was intended to be employed, and if the therapy was genuinely working and the remission had come about as a direct result of employing it, then although some minor relapses may occur at times when the client's going through difficult or challenging periods, Provided he continues to employ the techniques as intended, the bulk of the progress made during therapy should be retained, despite the doubts and insecurities that may arise in the client's mind. Another sign that the client's remission following therapy is because of a placebo effect, due to having been impressed by the therapist and their therapy, is that even though the client's overt symptoms and blocks may have diminished or even disappeared entirely, his underlying understanding and beliefs about stammering remain largely unchanged. In particular, he may still harbour the desire to be completely free from blocks and may still perceive stammering in an excessively negative light. Consequently, when the tendency to block returns, if the initial remission really was just as a result of a placebo effect, it tends to precipitate a disproportionate amount of anxiety and insecurity. This sudden return of high levels of anxiety and insecurity is a sign that the entire iceberg of stammering is still there and that all that had changed during the therapy and the associated period of remission was that the iceberg had been pushed temporarily under the surface. It had never melted away at all. There are four key factors that determine how complete a remission will be and how long it will last. These are a, whether or not we've learned a reliable method of dealing with blocks should they ever return, b, the robustness of our sense of self-esteem, C. An understanding that remission and relapse are intrinsic to the nature of stammering. And D. An acceptance of our stammering and of the cycles of remission and relapse that accompany it. With respect to the question of whether or not we've learned a reliable method of dealing with blocks, a closely associated factor is whether or not we're completely confident in our ability to successfully apply that method or methods of dealing with blocks should the need ever arise. If we have this confidence, then we'll be immune to the worry that the stammer might return. 
Ultimately, the only way that we can gain such confidence is by repeatedly experiencing blocks and repeatedly successfully dealing with them. In other words, in order to overcome our fear of stammering, we need to find ways of successfully managing the stammer in all the situations where it's likely to arise. Needless to say, we can't achieve this by practicing solely in a clinical setting. But importantly, we also can't do this during periods of remission. We have to get out in the outside world and put whatever techniques we've learnt into practice while we're in the midst of our stammering. In order to ensure that we do that, and to ensure that we have the opportunity to refresh our memory, the occasional minor relapse is actually not a bad thing. To be able to put techniques into action and, and to feel okay about doing it, we also need to have already developed a very solid sense of self-esteem. We have to feel good about ourselves no matter how much or how little we stammer. Indeed, we need to have reached the point where our self-esteem is completely independent of our stammering. A rock-solid sense of self-esteem is the essential foundation that enables us to practice and employ therapy techniques in everyday life. For adults at least, I would suggest that without a rock-solid sense of self-esteem, any speech therapy technique, no matter how good it is, is, is bound to fail to produce the desired results. If for no other reason, then the client will lack the confidence and the resilience to put it into practice whenever necessary in real life situations. To maintain a strong sense of self-esteem, one that remains so quite independently of our successes and failures with speech, or for that matter, independently of our successes and failures in life generally, ultimately boils down to a matter of spiritual development, which is a lifelong process. However, in the meantime, the more we study stammering and the more we come to understand about its nature, including how remission and relapse are intrinsic to it, the less our self-esteem is likely to be affected by these experiences of remission and relapse. Similarly, the more we understand about the nature of stammering, the easier it becomes to understand and accept the blocks that we experience, and the less likely we are to panic when they occur and to react to them in unhelpful ways. On a practical level, to reduce the negative impact of relapse, it helps to accept that some degree of relapse is almost certainly going to happen at some point of time. Indeed, as I mentioned previously, the occasional minor relapse is not a bad thing because we really do need opportunities to practice the techniques that we've learnt to enable us to maintain a strong degree of confidence in their efficacy and in our ability to employ them. Consequently, one could see minor relapses as opportunities to be welcomed rather than threats to be dreaded. In line with this, it's also helpful indeed I'd say essential when you're in remission and are no longer blocking, not to make the mistake of telling people that you're cured and to avoid allowing a state of affairs to develop with other people whereby they expect you not to block and where you feel the need to maintain the appearance of being cured. Similarly, take care not to fall into the trap of trying to hide, avoid or suppress the occasional blocks that may still occur. Always remember that blocking is okay. It's how you respond to the block that is critical. Avoid the temptation to try to speak completely perfectly and instead be happy to allow yourself to make speech errors and to block occasionally and use the blocks as opportunities to practice whatever speech techniques you've learned. <laughs>